Thomas Bateman, a local antiquarian, described Carl Walk in his classic archaeological text, Ten Years Diggings. Originally published in 1861, this book is an account of hundreds of excavations conducted by Bateman and his friend Samuel Carrington across the hills of the Peak District. Bateman thought that Carl Walk, being so monumental in scale, could only be the work of the Romans, and this was a view shared by many antiquarians of the time, believing prehistoric people to be primitives. Bateman, having lost both his parents at a young age, was brought up by his grandfather at Middleton Hall, near Yulegreave. As a child, he scoured his grandfather's many bookcases and developed a keen interest in archaeology. Victorian antiquarians were primarily concerned with acquiring artefacts, so their excavations were often conducted very haphazardly. Ancient tombs would simply be dug in from the side and top and burial goods removed for preservation. This method meant a large number could be excavated in a very short time. Bateman was reputed to have excavated more than a dozen in a single day. Bateman's books are still very relevant today, and understanding them is aided by his decision to adopt a new classification system. A Danish archaeologist called Christian Thompson had realised that the deepest and therefore oldest archaeological remains were of stone, followed by bronze and then iron. This classification system is still in use and gives us the familiar terms by which all archaeologists class eras of human time. Over the years, Bateman's interest was most piqued by the excavation of barrows. These large mounds of earth and stone were mostly built from 3000 to 1000 BC, and hundreds still survive in the Peak District. Inside, he found ceremonial weapons, burial urns and even jewellery. He eventually organised all of his finds into an amazing private museum at his home of Middleton Hall. If only it was still viewable today. Near to Bateman's lifelong home, we can follow an overgrown path to find a lasting monument. Unfortunately, Bateman's years of barrow digging were not to be many. August 28, 1861, he sadly passed away after a very short illness. He was only 39 years old. Five years later, his wife Sarah was to follow him, and they were both buried in this tomb, which is found behind the chapel in Middleton by your grave. In this small enclosure, this beautiful tomb was constructed in his memory. On top, a cinnary urn similar to many of those he excavated from the barrows he loved so much. One of his final wishes, and indeed one that was present in his will, was that his massive collection of archaeological remains should be kept together in perpetuity. But sadly, within a generation, it had been dispersed, and much is now lost to us. But his legacy lives on his three fantastic works and the impact he made not only on our understanding of prehistoric ritual monuments but also in the field of archaeology in general will live on and that is a fitting memorial for him. To gain a greater understanding of prehistoric ritual, we head through the pelting rain to the heart of the Eastern Moors. The Derbyshire mist has set in and I think it's going to be with us for the day, unfortunately. I'm reminded of a saying from Devonshire folk, which is nine months winter, three months bad weather. And for any of you who've visited Dartmoor, you could probably believe that. And a lot of the time, the Peak District can be like this. Still, it certainly has a splendid isolation and atmosphere to it on days like this. And you're not likely to see a soul around. Now, where we are, high on the moors above Sheffield, is quite a desolate location. 
Thomas Bateman was not only interested in barrows, he also had a fascination with many other ancient sites, and his friends would write to him concerning these places. In 1846, one of his friends was passing over the road from Sheffield into the Peak District when he came upon a ring of stones. This is the most iconic of the Bronze Age ritual monuments, not a barrow of earth, but instead a ring of monoliths open to the sky. You can find hundreds of these stone circles all over the British Isles, and indeed throughout the Peak District. But do not expect all of them to have dramatic or mythical names, for many lay undiscovered for millennia. Even though many of these sites are next to main trade routes or roadways, few of them have interesting folkloric or even ancient sounding names. The reason for that is that many of them lay unnoticed in the dark heather-clad moors which people wanted to cross as quickly as they could. The ring cairns and stone circles around here are merely named Barbrook 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. And that's down to the archaeologists who systematically surveyed the areas in the latter part of the 20th century, taking the location of the sites as their name. Here on Barbrook Moor, the sites may have dull names, but they offer us a fascinating insight into the belief system of Bronze Age man. Barbrook too, unlike its neighbour, is a circle of standing stones set into an unusual retaining dry stone wall. Barbrook Free is a much larger ring, but its tiny stone holes lie hidden amongst the moorland grasses. Barbrook 4 appears to be a circle of rubble, and Barbrook 5 is a barely noticeable ring of earth. And amongst them all are strange mounds, piles of rock and miniature rings of stone. All evidence that prehistoric man lived thickly on these moors. Archaeologists and historians love to categorise. And when we look at stone circles, many people in the past have tried to understand the way in which they were constructed. One famous archaeologist and archaeoastronomer named Alexander Thom surveyed several hundred stone circles during the latter part of the 20th century. He believed they had been constructed using a standard unit of measurement called a megalithic yard, similar to how we would use feet and inches or metres and centimetres today. He even said that many of the stone circles apply to certain patterns, flattened A, flattened B and other designs. But in fact, maybe we're putting just a bit too much emphasis on the early constructors of these sites 4,000 years to go. In fact, it may be, or is most likely, that these circles were constructed using a standard peg and rope technique. You would find a suitable location in the landscape, place a peg and a rope, and draw out a simple circle with it, placing the stones around. But that brings in something else that's very interesting. Why were the stones placed where they were placed? Why were there as many stones as there were? Something we may not know the answer to. But many people have found interesting and sometimes even possible complex alignments at many of these sites. Here at Barbrook 1, we have one stone over here with a notch. And here, on midwinter's day, the sun would have rose from behind that notch in the landscape to have travelled throughout the day across the following three stones to finally set down the slope of this stone. It's a very interesting alignment, one that unfortunately we probably cannot prove. Perhaps we're putting too much emphasis on these sites because many of them have no alignments that we can see whatsoever. I think the most important thing to remember is that the most impressive ceremonial backdrop possible is right behind us the landscape the circle is in. And that is probably what was most important to the ancient builders, finding a suitable site in the landscape, highlighting the features around them. Another interesting note for the landscape setting of stone circles is that the vast majority were located not on the tops of hills, but their false crests. A likely reason for this could be that earlier chambered tombs and cairns, which we shall look at later, were constructed on hilltops, leading us to surmise that Bronze Age man did not want to interfere with earlier religious monuments. The majority of the surviving stone circles in the Peak District are found on the Eastern Moors, one of the best preserved prehistoric landscapes in the whole of Britain. Almost 60 rings can still be found scattered amongst the upland heather and bog. Although collectively called stone circles, the sites can be further subcategorized into three different architectural construction techniques. The first category is the free standing circles. These are the most simple of constructions, being a ring of standing stones embedded into the ground. 
The second category is the embanked stone circles, where a circular bank of earth is constructed and then the stones are laid into the inside of the bank. The third and final type of stone circle is the ring cairn, which is simply a bank of earth, sometimes with a small curb of stones. Ring cairns have affinities with other sites, for example, a robbed out burial cairn or an embanked stone circle whose stones have been removed, so only excavation can definitively reveal their nature. Although there are three broad categories of stone circles, some sites simply defy categorisation. The Bullstrang is found in a particularly dramatic location above Wabaclough in the heart of the Cheshire Peaks. The site is made up of a large central standing stone and surrounding circular curve of small stones. 19th century Cheshire archaeologist J.D. Sainter surveyed and excavated the site, drawing it in a more complete form than is visible today, with a notoriously emphasised entrance that is no longer visible. Sainter's excavation in 1878 revealed the bones of a young person in inverted urn, along with a calcined flint knife and arrowhead. Is it a stone circle? Is it a burial cairn? We just don't know. And the we don't know statement can be applied to the question you are probably all thinking right now. So just what were stone circles used for? Having no written records and only the evidence preserved in the soil, we can make a series of factual statements and then some suppositions about the uses of stone circles. We know that stone circles were used for burial. Artifacts found within those burials, such as jewellery and weaponry, and the fact that some burials are cremated while others are complete, suggest that a ritualistic element was involved and therefore the circle would be an aspect of that. In present-day religious rituals, it is not just the ceremony of death that takes place in a place of worship, but also celebrations of marriage, coming of age, and observations of seasonal changes. It is therefore likely that these two would have taken place at stone circles, although these rituals leave no archaeological trace. The highly formal nature of circles may also be meant to emphasise social equality, for in a circle, everybody stands equal. Though if this is the case, maybe it was a means of regulation, with everyone linked and feeling part of the same belief system. What gods, goddesses or spirits did they believe in? What dates in the calendar were celebrated? When did people come together to observe ritual? We can only guess. Barbrook 1 may be part of a ritual landscape, but it does not stand in isolation. Across the valley and up the hillside into the low cloud is the remains of a prehistoric settlement, one of many scattered across the eastern moors of Derbyshire. They have survived down the centuries because these areas were too poor for agricultural improvement. Now, these ancient settlements are an open book for archaeologists to read and give us a fascinating insight into prehistoric life. These may have been where they were buried, but that is where the people lived. The Eastern Moors were an area of high population density during the Bronze Age. All across this plateau of highland, there would have been settlements dividing and working the landscape. The settlement across from the stone circles of Barbrick Moor covers some 55 hectares, making it the largest prehistoric settlement in the Peak District. Low banks mark the original positions of hedge and fences, subdividing a series of irregular fields. These would have been a mix of arable and cattle, each farmstead choosing its own working pattern. At the southern tip of the settlement is a farmstead known as Swinesty. One of the clearest to view and best preserved, the site was excavated during the 60s and 70s. This small enclosure was found to be a stone-footed house, three and a half metres in internal diameter. Too small for a family, this is likely one of the last additions to the settlement, perhaps a lone shepherd's hut constructed towards the end of occupation, when most of the other houses have been abandoned. But archaeologists don't just look at the surface. When they excavated below the stone footings, they found the remains of a preceding timber house six metres in diameter. This would have been a much more typical structure, with a reconstruction from Somerset pictured here. The roof was thatched, with a hole to allow out the smoke from the central fire. When there was heavy rain, a simple cap could be placed on top. Inside was a communal area around the main fire, and the outer extremities could be split up using cloth into a series of different rooms. Both pottery and fabrics were discovered in the excavation of Swinestye. Being in a settlement, many families would also produce artefacts for trade. To obtain other necessities, they were not growing or making themselves. At Swinestye, the cottage industry was found to be shale, which they ground and carved into rings and bracelets. Away from the eastern moors, we have little evidence of Bronze Age occupation. Their major settlement centres would have been on the rich limestone soils, but almost all evidence has been wiped away by future generations. 
the much higher northern and western moors would have had some settlement, but due to their altitude and heavy dissection by deep river gorges, they were far less suitable for the Bronze Age population. The stone circles at Barbrook Moor would have served those living in the local area, but other stone circles would have provided a focus for people from many miles around. Arbelow is the largest stone circle in the Peak District. Even though all of its 50 plus stones lie strewn on the ground, you can still get an idea of just how impressive it must have been when they were all still standing. For a long time it was postulated the stones were never upright, but evidence on the ground of seven stumps confirms the fact that they once stood. All fell in antiquity, probably because of shallow stone holes and fracturing of the already eroded limestone rock. The stones themselves would have looked weathered even in the Bronze Age, having been quarried from a nearby but now vanished limestone pavement. Even though you would now count over 50 stones, originally there would have been less, probably between 41 and 43, as a number of the monoliths have broken into smaller pieces with the effects of time. The ring appears to have been height aligned to the south-southwest, where the entrance and a three metre tall stone would have marked the location of the midwinter sunrise. Being so large, it is likely that Arbolo would have served a significant portion of the widely scattered population in the Peak District. It would have been a place where they could gather at certain times of the year, not just for social or religious reasons, but for the very important task of trading. But this is a train of thought we shall return to later, as first we need to look at one very special plateau in the heart of the peaks near Bakewell. Like on Barbrook Moor, almost all of the stone circles in the Peak District are associated with specific settlements. But Stanton Moor, a massive gritstone dissected on all sides by rivers, stands out as a unique ritual landscape. On its summit plateau, you can see an array of over 70 cairns, standing stones and at least five stone circles. It may well be that local communities chose to build their ritual monuments together on this nexus point as the central cog in a wheel of settlement. The views from the plateau are stunning, looking down to the Y Valley and the higher limestone plateau to the west. Well-trodden tracks crisscross the undulating plain, many dating back hundreds if not thousands of years. One of the most iconic features of the plateau was not ancient at all. The heavily eroded plug of the corkstone is the remnants of local gritstone quarrying, the iron bars added during the 19th century. The other iconic feature of the plateau is, however, very ancient, and is without a doubt the most well-known stone circle in the Peak District, the Nine Ladies. Those who visit the Nine Ladies and are able to count may note that there are, in fact, ten stones. But the tenth stone that's behind me was dug up relatively recently by persons unknown. And actually, originally, the circle would have been eleven stones, the eleventh standing in this large gap here. The ring itself is eleven and a half by ten and a half metres in diameter. It's surrounded inside an embankment of earth, roughly about two to two and a half metres wide. You can see the ring of it around the outside of the stones, but much worn down over the millennia. In the centre here would have been a burial cairn. Sadly, you can see there's been fires on the site which have damaged it, and there's probably robbing that has taken place. There is some folklore attached to the site, but very little of it appears to be of any kind of antiquity. There seems to be an applications of legends about nine ladies dancing on the Sabbath and turned to stone, getting up and going down and drinking at water. It seems like they've stolen many of the legends from places such as the Rollwright Stones or Long Meg, where we have the legends going back into greater antiquity. There is, in the distance this way, a single outlying stone called the King Stone. Now leaning at an angle after being, being damaged, this is the one that the van backed into. Interestingly, the name Kingstone does seem to go back quite a way. This could be associated to a now lost legend. The Royal Wright Stones in Oxfordshire have the King's men next to them. Perhaps that was the King, and this could have been his army or his pipers turned to stone for deeds unknown. Usually, outlying stones have certain specific alignments 
where they would have been aligned to points in the hill or perhaps even solar or lunar events. We found none from this direction as it stands. The stone may not have originally leaned, as I said, it was originally backed into and damaged, and quite sadly as well, there's even graffiti being carved onto the side of it. It's terrible when people think that it's in any way appropriate to desecrate our ancient monuments. Across the moor are several other stone circles, most going unnoticed by the thousands of people who visit here each year. Stanton Moor 1, just north of the Nine Ladies, is in the worst condition. Embanked with an internal diameter of 10 by 9 metres, only a single stone survives, hidden amongst the trees in detritus. It was excavated in the 18th century by Samuel Rook, who discovered urns, cremations and the bronze all. In the centre of the plateau are Stanton Moor 3 and 4. Both are unusually triangular in shape, with the appearance of three curved corners to each circle. No reason has yet been found or imagined for this design. Stanton Moor 3 is 19.5 metres in diameter internally, with only three small flanking stones remaining within the north and south entrances. Internally the circle is very hummocky, mostly due to having been chosen by a colony of rabbits for their warren, though two possible burial cairns can be traced near the centre. The heather has not been burnt back here for a couple of decades, and now, standing in some parts at waist height, it is starting to smother the site. Stanton Moor 4 is more clearly visible, standing right next to the main track. It has an internal diameter of 13.5 by 12.5 metres, and unlike Stanton Moor 3, has six of a possible 11 stones remaining inside. Four are fallen, and the biggest, at 0.6 metres high, doesn't catch the eye. It is unusual, with the excellent state of the nine ladies, and the lack of enclosure walls on Stanton Moor, that the other circles have fared so badly. Come by the hills to a land where legend remains Where stories of old fill the heart and may yet come again Where the past has been lost and the future has yet to be won And the cares of tomorrow can wait till this day is done One more stone circle remains of the well-trodden routes across the plateau. To find it, you must cross the field which contains the massive bulk of the Eagle Stone and enter into the shady woodland below. This is, in my opinion, the most perfect and magical little stone circle in the whole of the Peak District. Known as Dol Tor, it shelters in a coniferous plantation on the western side of Stanton. The little circle is six by four and a half metres in diameter, 
with none of the stones more than a metre high. Of other interest is the fact that the stones are all linked by a three course high dry stone wall, which is unusual in the Peak District when most of the rings are either freestanding or embanked with a ring of earth around them. Also, abutting onto the eastern end of the circle is a large cairn. This has been excavated many times both by Thomas Bateman, the Heathcotes and several others and a huge number of artefacts and cremations have been found within the cairn. Not just that, burials have also been found within the circle. When we think about stone circles, it can be quite difficult to put them in context because only the remains of death survive. If you have a special ceremony for birth or for coming of age or for marriage, nothing of it will survive in the archaeological record. I don't like to think of these places just as places of death, but think of them as living monuments. These were obviously for a ritual purpose, which we can think about on many different levels. But at the end of the day, it will just be conjecture. We will never find the archaeological evidence. Thomas Bateman was the first to excavate Doltor on an April day in 1852. He recorded he'd find a broken urn and incense cups. The Heathcotes, who did an amazingly in-depth survey of the whole of Stanton Moore's archaeological features, excavated the circle between 1931 and 1934. They found a complex series of cremations and urns both within the circle and the adjoining cairn, which itself is made up of a sequence of stone graves and cremations. When the Heathcotes were excavating Dol Tor during the 1930s, two of the stones were inexplicably smashed to pieces one night. We still don't know who did this, but they were reconstructed, cemented back together and placed within the circle. Obviously, somebody was upset about the circle being touched or perhaps did not want people visiting. But people do still visit to this day. And as this little offering of Heather shows, it's still important to a great many people. Whether they are pagans who believe that the site has some reverence, or whether they are people just looking to experience their ancient ancestors. What's also interesting is that across on this side of the circle, the large fir tree has now become what's known as a clouty tree. And people place their offerings, whether it be symbols such as a pentagram or pieces of cloth, sending wishes or hopes to people, hoping to cure ailments, or perhaps just getting rid of bad dreams. When you come to a clouty tree, you should never disturb anything on it, otherwise the bad luck or ailment will apparently go straight to you. In the dappled woodland, it's easy to see why people still find this place has a magical quality. It may not be in its original landscape setting, locked away in a modern plantation, but here it feels timeless, and being withdrawn from the surrounding distractions, the power of the site enlightens all who visit. Come by the hills to a land where legend remains, where stories of old fill the heart and may yet come again, where the past has been lost. And the future has yet to be won And the cares of tomorrow can wait Till this day is gone Just below Stanton Moor is a large outcrop of gritstone hidden away in rich woodland.
The cavern I'm in now is not natural. In fact, this entire hillside, known as Rauta Rocks, is a catacomb of man-made caves, shelters and carvings. This pillar was put here at the same time that many of these caverns were carved or placed together. It's Victorian, because this is a dream of a local Victorian gentleman, one who was impassioned by the local antiquities and history and wanted to create something to please his friends and family within the landscape they owned. Router Rocks is the work of a local parson named Thomas Eyre. The Eyres are an extremely ancient family who came across with William the Conqueror from Normandy and were granted lands in Derbyshire. A distant member of the line was Robert the Eyre, who was warden of the Royal Forest of the Peak. Thomas Eyre lived in the Grand Vicarage at Birchover and over many years built a lot of what can be seen at Router Rocks today. In one of the cliff faces at Router Rocks, there has been created a series of fairy steps. There's quite famous fairy steps at several places in Britain. And these are areas where you have pathways between narrow ravines or cliff faces. And it's said that if you can get all the way up or down without touching the sides, then the fairy folk will appear to you. Of course, it's often easier said than done. And especially here. Yeah, I'm not going to get down without touching the sides. I guess that means another day without any magical appearances. It was said that Thomas Eyre used to climb up to the summit of Router Rocks, following its secret and winding paths to the rocks where he used to sit and meditate on the landscape. It was here he got the inspiration for his sermons. The whole outcrop is no more than 80 yards long, but the pathways, caves and carvings are so hidden amongst the crags that you used to have to pay a guide to lead you around. In Victorian times, the site was advertised as an ancient place of the Druids. Obviously, this was a gimmick for the tourists, but interesting enough, the pub below the rocks, the Druid Inn, was used as a meeting place for the more modern, ancient order of Druids. One thing that both Thomas and the guides missed were far more ancient markings on the rocks. <sighs> Practically unheard of in the Peak District up until a few decades ago, what we have here is a fascinating example of prehistoric rock carvings, 4,000 years old, surviving amongst all of this Victorian creation. We can see here a circular indent, a cup surrounded by a series of rings. Although rock art is most famous in places like Northumbria and the North York Moors, it's found in several other places in Britain and the, the carvings that survive here are really fascinating. Not a lot of rock art can be found in the Peak District, as the rocks do not lend themselves to the survival of carvings over the millennia. The majority of those that remain were buried, or as in the case at Router Rocks, were in heavily wooded areas that protected them from some of the ravages of weathering. Cups and rings are the most common type of carving in Britain, but a few more complex designs have been found, such as on a boulder here at Router Rocks, which seems to be a quartered circle with an intricate cup and petal design. Again, we can only speculate on their meaning. To see clearer examples, we can head to the area of best preserved rock art in England, the mystical county of Northumberland. On the barren moorlands, huge numbers of boulders have been carved with intricate patterns. These rocks were etched over several millennia, so undoubtedly styles will have changed, but as yet we do not know their chronology. Many of the rocks chosen to be carved face upwards, perhaps suggesting an astronomical significance. One idea is that they may be star maps, or representations of the moon and sun. Even if not, the shape of the circle is obviously important to Bronze Age man. Others, however, have suggested alternative interpretations such as fertility symbols, maps, patterns from hallucinogenic rituals, or perhaps as aspects of water symbolism. The majority do indeed collect water, and the cups and rings could represent ripples from raindrops. We will never know, and perhaps that's part of their magic, for we can all touch our ancestors' carvings and interpret them in the way that inspires or connects us to our past the most. The highly formal nature of stone circles, cairns and to an extent rock art suggests that in Bronze Age times an emphasis was placed on a belief system as a means of social regulation. Our society's modern day meetings often have a defined focal point where emphasis is paid to one particular person but the circular nature of rings emphasises the group rather than the individual. This focus on community does, however, mask the rise of the elite that occurred during the Bronze Age. 
By 1500 BC, the last stone circle had been built. It seems that a new hierarchical order with a defined ruling chieftain was becoming established, one that no longer thought labour-intensive monuments were necessary. Farming became more segregated with defined land ownership, no longer needing any reminder of traditional rights. The magnificent monuments that had stood for family and community became anachronistic, antiquities belonging to another age. As we know, the Bronze Age concluded in a way suited to its newfound ideologies, with a total social collapse. Upland areas had been overworked for a long time, and the final trigger was the eruption in 1150 BC of Mount Hecla in Iceland. The volcano ejected thousands of tonnes of hot ash and debris into the atmosphere, blotting out the sun and causing a volcanic winter over northern Europe for many years. The overworked land failed. Harvests were ruined and the blanket bogs and peat began to creep over the deserted hills where Bronze Age man had once thrived. Famines swept the entire country and population movement occurred on a massive scale, and Britain was plunged into a dark age from which, as we know, only the strongest communities would survive. But all societies undergo change. Whether internal or external factors trigger them, change keeps us evolving. When trying to connect with our prehistoric ancestors, one of the best ways of doing it is not to read a book or watch a documentary, but to get out there and meet them for ourselves, to make a pilgrimage to a special place just like they would have done. We are now going to journey to our final stone circle, which lies on the picturesque Harthill Moor. But this is more than just a walk to the stone circle. We should be taking in everything that makes this small patch of the Peak District unique. Begin our walk by entering into a low hollow way on part of the famous Derbyshire Portway, an ancient series of green lanes dating back to at least Roman times, but probably Bronze Age in origin. The portway can be traced all the way from Castleton to Nottingham. Partway up the low sloping hillside, we cut off into a large plantation known as Carr's Wood. Relatively modern, with a mix of coniferous and deciduous trees, its open nature means it is relatively rich in plants and animals. As you cross the slope and carry on your ascent, more gritstone boulders become visible and the path intertwines between them. Deep within the woods, below brooding cliffs and encompassed by a series of centuries-old yew trees, is our first place of pilgrimage. Behind these iron bars is an amazing survival. We're here nestling under cracked cliff rocks and in this natural rock shelter we find a 14th century carving of Christ. This was in fact a medieval hermit's cave. Documentary evidence suggests it may have been occupied up until the end of at least the 16th century, giving it a probable several hundred years of history. You must remember that hermits were not cut off from the outside world completely. Local landowners and indeed people with good hearts would bring them up food and water to help them survive through the harsh conditions they would find. But it was important to the hermits, like it was to the monks who lived in the abbeys, to be close to God, to live a life of prayer, and above all else, to be pure. Although many places around the country have the names Hermit's Caves, few of them actually are being given those names by fanciful Victorians, but here we have the real deal. The carving of Christ is four foot high, and beside is a small niche for a candle. A manuscript, the rule of hermits of the 14th century, states, Let it suffice thee to have on thine altar an image of the Saviour hanging upon the cross, 
which represents to thee his passion, which thou shalt imitate, inviting thee with outspread arms to himself. It has survived in remarkable condition considering its age, though some damage was incurred when the site was used as a climbing shelter. We do not know who the hermit was, but a record from Haddon Hall dated 23rd of December 1548 notes a payment to Ye Harmit for supplying ten rabbits, and a later note mentions him guiding people to Haddon. He was obviously a useful member of the local community. Beside the hermit's cave, spectacular cliffs rise to the summit of Crackcliff Rocks, offering panoramic views of the magical landscape. The view from Crackcliff Rocks is one of the most stunning in the Peak District. But as well as being a stunning view, there's also yet more ancient sites lying around it. High up behind me, amongst the tangle of heather and bilberry and bracken, there's the remains of an Iron Age defended enclosure. In fact, there are two right next to each other. These interesting monuments are yet more pieces in the historic landscape that we find around Hart Hill Moor. This is the barely visible bank of one of the Iron Age enclosures the other hidden away under bracken. The ditch was there for defence like most Iron Age structures, and they probably would have served either as a farmstead or a place to keep cattle at night. Just across the moor is the hill fort of Castle Ring, now defined by a modern dry stone wall. It is one of the smaller hill forts in the Peak District, covering around half a hectare. The site has never been excavated, but an external ditch and internal rampart up to two metres high are still clearly visible. Down slope from the enclosure lies the main aim of our pilgrimage. The highlight of the walk has to be the stone circle of nine stone close, also known as the Grey Ladies. Standing prominently in a landscape filled with lore and legend and below the towering gritstone spires of Robin Hood Stride, it's one of the best stone circles in the Peak District if you want to experience the atmosphere and ambience that comes with visiting such an ancient place. Four stones remain, standing 1.94 to 2 metres tall, in the eastern arc of a circle 13.5 by 12 metres in diameter. A fifth stone was taken away and used in an hour blocked up gateway to the south of the circle. In 1782, Heyman Rook noted seven stones making up the ring, the two missing stones probably smashed and used in the dry stone wall which crosses the site today. The Heathcotes excavated the site in 1939. The southernmost stone had fallen in 1936 and they re-erected it along with restoring the badly leaving northern stone. Both were set in concrete. They found the southern stone was a massive 3.35 metres long, 1.3 metres of which was buried underground. The stone holes were exceptionally deep and surprisingly narrow, but they made no finds below them. It is not only archaeology and ancient sites this landscape abounds in. Hart Hill Moor is also rich in folklore. Nine Stone Close has more associated with it than any other stone circle in the Peak District. Much of it concerns the fairy folk. Only two fields away is an old drove road and in the 19th century travellers reported seeing lights dancing amongst the ring. These were thought to be the fairies. There's also the tale of a farmhand. Walking past the site one afternoon, he spotted a small pipe by one of the stones. He sat down with his back against it, filled the pipe with tobacco, and as he took his first puff, he noticed around him that a whole ring of dancing fairies had appeared. Their music played through his ears and it was one of the most amazing experiences he ever had. Unfortunately, as he took his final puff, the little tiny pipe crumbled away through his hands and the fairies disappeared from his sight forever. It is highly likely that the natural outcrop of Robin Hood Stride played a major part in the sighting of the circle. From the ring, the full moon at midsummer would have been framed by the two natural pillars on its summit. An origin story for the Grey Lady Circle concerns the Green Man, then a giant and in later legends reimagined as Robin Hood. He was said to have stood astride the two pinnacles on the outcrop of Robin Hood Stride and urinated onto the fields below. Nine maidens who were watching him were so shocked that they turned to stone. In the final episode, we shall conclude our journey back in time and through the seasons by meeting our most ancient ancestors. <laughs>